Uh, my name is Ariel Schrag, and I am extremely excited to be here interviewing Phoebe Gleckner. For those of you who don't know, Phoebe is the author of A Child's Life and Diary of a Teenage Girl, which was recently made into a movie. She has also worked as a medical illustrator, and she's currently a professor at the University of Michigan Stamp School of Art and Design. Her current project is a multimedia novel, which is based on several families living in Juarez, Mexico. So to start off, I um, just want to talk a little bit about, go way back to a child's life, which was when I first learned of Phoebe's work, and um, came out in 1998, and I had been doing comics for a few years, and discovered this book, which was basically like this book I'd been waiting to discover, I felt like, my whole life, which was this collection of autobiographical stories, um, focused on sexuality, and also all of these really cool, creepy medical illustra illustrations throughout. Um, I had actually also wanted to be a medical illustrator and see this woman doing basically what I wanted to do was, was amazing. And the stories were dark and disturbing and fantastically drawn. And I instantly loved Phoebe's work. So I guess one question that I have um, is most of the stories in a child's life were written between uh, around 1989, 96. Would you say that's about the time span? I don't know. Most of them, I think. I mean, just looking at the dates on the on know. them, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I guess I'm curious what your life was like at that time, and some sort of what allowed for such an output of work, sort of what you were doing, and maybe what your work habits were like. Um, well, thinking about that time, I I had always done comics like you since as a teenager, and. Um, then out of the blue, a publisher asked me if I wanted to publish a book. And we decided that he would collect my work. And um, I did that. I mean, I put everything together and I realized, no, I'm going to have to add into this. It was kind of a, a collection, but which had a lot of new work in it. But the new work was kind of um, working to integrate and fill in all this other stuff. Not to say that it ended up being a story by itself, the book. Um, okay, but you were asking me how I. I was but just curious, like what? What was this living? burst of energy? Were you, were you oh, living, were you, were you okay. Married or dating somebody? I mean, I'm always interested in the personal details of like what. Okay. The circumstances that allow for because I see the book and and I also think of like okay that's a lot of hours like sitting there right. intensely being devoted to this. Thing. Okay, so what was I doing? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, well, I met someone who was to be my husband later on. And oddly enough, we went into City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. And he hadn't seen any of my work. And they had a copy of the Atrocity Exhibition, which was a book that uh, I had done the drawings for. It's a J.G. Ballard book. And um, I showed it to him. And he was just, his face went pale. And he didn't say much, but then his mother had come to town to visit him a week or so later. And I knew she was there, but he never extended an invitation for me to meet her. And uh, she was an artist. And then I said, well, why aren't I going to meet your mother? And he said, well, you know, she's an artist as well, but I think she would find your work unseemly. <laughs> and, and oddly enough, I think I kind of like, you know, tried to push that information back down, but I should have known. Um, but anyway, red flag, so to speak. Yeah, it was. But we had, we did, we eventually got married, and um, I already had one child who was like three or four, and then we had another. Um, and on the surface, it was it was a very kind of middle class stable family, something that I had never had, by the way. So it was, you know, I felt very comfortable because I had never had this. It, it was like a, being a dog in a comfortable carrier. Uh, um, and I relaxed a little. This was in Montclair in the Oakland Hills. Yeah, yeah, on Snake Road. Yeah. Since you wanted details, right. And, um, but okay, my comics, you know, if you say you do comics, people think they're for kids or something, and 
I had kids now, but yet I didn't want my kids to see my work, especially at their very young age. Um, so I would draw every night. I would just draw and draw and draw. And um, I think I was driven because I finally, at the first time in my life, and I wasn't young, I was like 32 or something, when I got this contract, and it took me a few years to finish it, um, I had never like had a complete thing, you know, two covers and my work in between. So it was just so much fun to kind of shape this. And, you know, I, I assumed people would just accept it as a, a collection of my work as if it was all previously published, but it wasn't. But you know, does that answer it? Yeah, I don't know. I have it, and so yeah. were you working, in, what, uh, had you done your work as a medical illustrator before this and then just kind of wanted to? Oh, no, no, no. No, I was still working. So you were still working as a medical illustrator? Yeah. So, you were, yeah. Okay. I think my life has always been like that. I'm always working, like always. Um which is tiring and frustrating if you're not able to spend the time on the things you want to spend the time on. But I was doing freelance illustration mm -hmm. and I had a bunch of clients. Well, I had kind of gotten this. This is not playing by itself. Why? Um, that's some medical yeah, illustration. Yeah. But somehow or another, I had ended up having two kind of niche sets of clients. One was the Academy of Ophthalmology. <laughs> and so I was just drawing eye after eye after eye. <laughs> all these diseases. And then yeah. that little poster there is a Finnish film festival. But they picked up one of the eyes out of the blue and That's made so it their good. logos. So cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really see the influence of all the medical illustration in just like the detail and in, in your work and the I don't know, there's something so like pulsing biological, I think, about your figures that, I don't know, that I really love. It's, it's funny because, I mean, I don't think of, I people have said my work is realistic, but I don't think of it as at all realistic, actually. It, it seems, I, I know that I stylize things, yeah. and if I don't see what I want to see, then I change the drawing to be what I want to see, you know, yeah. so it's not always, um, but... At any rate, so I did medical illustration that I thought of as, as my creative art, and I also did medical illustration just to make a living. Mm -hmm. And this, this was from that J.G. Ballard book that I mentioned earlier. And that, I just loved to do it. They, this publisher just researched publications in San Francisco, which was kind of a punk-type pu publisher then. Um, they handed me this this book by J.G. Ballard, who was an experimental British author, who coincidentally had studied to be a doctor, decided against it or dropped out of school at the end, and instead became a writer. Mm -hmm. And his writing um, was filled with juxtapositions of horror or despair or political scenarios, um, but they were juxtaposed with like these, like violent deaths or disease and these other things. So the publisher handed me the book, the, the manuscript, and said, read it, do whatever you, whatever you want, whatever you want. Um, and it, I've never seen this book, so is it, is it still available? Yeah, yeah, but anyway. Um, so I was, I had studied medical illustration in graduate school and my head was filled with stuff that I wanted to draw. So I just started drawing. Um, this particular illustration is from that book. And um, this got me a lot of work, believe it or not. <laughs> but I started working for people developing um, erectile <laughs> dysfunction treatments. This, this inspired them? This worked out their problems? No. <laughs> Well, no, I, it was really weird. I got a very strange phone call one day from a man who sounded like he was talking with like Kleenex over his the receiver. And he said, well, I've heard about you. I know you're a medical illustrator, and that's what you studied. And I saw the atrocity exhibition, and I have a job that I think you might be suited for. And he wanted me to come meet him. And I was kind of nervous because it's kind of creepy. Yeah. But he was developing... There was, before there was Viagra, men would take a similar drug and 
there was no good delivery system for it, and there were a variety of ways where it would be used. And one of them was by injection. You had to inject your blood vessels near your penis and that. And then the way that this man had developed, he had developed this device called the Muse. And it was like a, a tampon, really, a little tampon, but very thin. And you would put it in your urethra and then, you know, work it as a plunger. It would, like, inject this kind of toothpaste into your urethra. Or, and, um, and then you would have to, like, massage the penis until it began to become turgid, right? So... Anyway, so he wanted me to do all these illustrations. So like the step, like the how to, how to use it. Process. It's just everything. Wow. I was just drawing everything. And, that sounds really fun. And I think, <laughs> but, but he was so shy about it because, it, I mean, it was actually a good idea. It's yeah, better yeah. than getting an injection, right? Yeah. And so, but he handed me photos for reference. And they were like these shitty little, like, you know, Kodak things yeah. with the kind of textured paper, you know, you know, that. Anyway, and he, and I looked at it, and I said, uh-huh, uh-huh, and he was showing me what each one was, and then I noticed that the ring on his hand was the same ring as the ring in the picture, <laughs> which, but, ag no, but again, but again, you have to understand, who is he going to ask? He's like, he's like, he's an entrepreneur, he's starting right. his own business, he's got to keep hustling. But, but I don't think this was like, it was a sexual yeah, yeah. exchange for him. I think, oh God, I mean, because I, I was thinking, moment, of course he did it. Who's he going to ask to do that for him? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, That's you know. Thing. So, but after that, I, I started drawing, like, I, I just got job after job doing, like, sex manuals, mm -hmm. the encyclopedia yeah. of weird sex practices, and then the joys of sex toys and anyway, but it was a living. I was making yeah. a living. And then this is a child's life that you were talking about. Um, cool. And I guess it didn't hurt that Robert Crumb said, I'll do the introduction, you know. So yes. that was, yeah, yes. right. Um, although I did find his introduction a little creepy. It's, uh, <laughs> you find everything creepy, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I actually found it very apt for the stories in the book. It, I guess, yeah, but it, yeah. right, the, the introduction, the reason, if you didn't know, to just say why, it, oh, why he, did you find he, it important? Well, he starts off the introduction by saying that he was very sexually attracted to Phoebe when she was a teenager, <laughs> which is not like a standard way as to introduce an artist's work, um, I mean, maybe for our crumb, uh, but, uh, you know, he does, and then, of course, go on to say how much he admires um, Phoebe's art, but, of course, this book is about, many of the stories in the book are about adult men abusing um, children, so. It's right, but apropos. in Robert Crumb's favor, I will say that I did know him when I was a teenager. He was a friend of my mother, and um, he was one of the most appropriate adults in my life. I never had one, I never had, I had no sexual feeling from him at all. Yeah. And he was always really interested and helpful and, but he's told me the same story about, yeah. you know, but I didn't pick up on it. Well, that's, I mean, that is a really good point. You know, it's like, you can, somebody can not say that, but then you just get such a creepy, horrible vibe from them that is worse, I think, than. Right, but I think basically he was an appropriate yeah. adult. I mean, he's a normal person. Most people yeah. have this filter, yeah. whether they could, you know, write these things in, in their other persona or not. No, yeah. So. Um, cool. Well, let's move on to Diary of a Teenage Girl a little bit, which, um, so this was, and correct me if you're wrong, but based mainly on your diaries that you found that you had written as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also wrote comics that were, based on my diaries as a teenager, and I'm, I'm curious to sort of hear what your editing process was in terms of how you chose what to take, what to then turn into cartoon versus um, keeping as prose, whether you fictionalized anything in terms of actual facts or whether it was just kind of the crafting of the story, sort of what your process was to approach it to create this novel that really does have a in some ways, its own arc, you know? It doesn't feel rambling the way, like, just a bunch of diary pages would. Right. Um, no, it was actually very difficult, um, because even I assumed having this diary, I thought, well, gee, I'll make a, a book, and, um, 
it won't be so hard. Um, but then there's this problem when 20 years have passed and you're looking at something that you did a long time ago, it's you and you recognize yourself very clearly, but yet you think of yourself as that child. And if the material is in any way upsetting or, you know, you want to take care of that child the way you never would have taken care about yourself or, or had any pity on yourself. And um, because as a teenager, I certainly did not like myself. But from that distance, I was suddenly able to have empathy for that child. So, um, but there's the, the added thing where you felt like, is it, it almost feels precious, like you can't change a word or you're like... Betraying that child. Betraying that child, right. So you have to overcome all of that shit mm -hmm. because, well, the betray, the betraying idea. Yeah. Um, is that water? Can I have that water right there? I'm so thirsty. Dying. Okay, whoa. Cheers. Whoops. <laughs> um, so, um, and as a matter of fact, a bunch of diary pages does not make an interesting read. Yeah. You know, you scan for it to look for something exciting, and yeah. but you're not getting a full picture. Yeah. There's a lot. It's very, very redundant too. Diaries. It is, and there's also a lot of extraneous characters mm -hmm. in the sense that you write about them once, and then you never know what happened to them, and totally. they disappear. And there's, um, so it it took me many attempts. At first, I was going to do the whole thing as a comic, uh, but then it it just wasn't saying the same thing. I wasn't getting in the head of the girl as much in the same way. And so then I tried to do like uh, the text with single illustrations, two of which are those. And that also didn't work because by nature, an uh, individual illustration like that, uh, when it's embedded in text, will be redundant of the text. Mm -hmm. You know, there were three girls in the kitchen, whatever. It's not adding anything. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't um, propel the narrative at all. So the, if you haven't seen it, the, the end product is a, is a hybrid of text and comics with some other illustrations. And it was, you know, the challenge was to make that feel like a seamless read, not to have someone turn the page and say, oh, fuck, a comic, you know. Or the, if you read comics, a block of text, oh, my God. Right, yeah. So... Um, um, Anyway, that was my goal. That's what I wanted to do, to make this book that was a, a hybrid that felt like it belonged in that form. Um, and... So I guess, like, with in terms of choosing which sections to draw as cartoons, I mean, I always imagined that... Were those moments that stuck in your head in a, in a memory-type way that felt like you could really express this best through cartoons? Or how did you... Well, a lot. Choose which what, yeah. You know I mean, like, what felt, what kind of led a certain section? Because in the book, you'll kind of move into, like she was saying, like sort of five pages of like almost like little vignettes on their own. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think I decided, um, you know, I had millions of memories, everybody does, and you don't really know where they fall chronologically. You know, you don't know, really know if it was before this or after this. And, um, so you just have to accept that these memories, you're going to use them where they work. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I had the diary all copied and typed out, and uh, there were holes, and um, or there were things. Oh, that's interesting. So they filled holes in the well in the diary narrative. Almost. They almost filled holes in the diary na narrative, or they were things that weren't fully fleshed and in the diary, but were more important, or had become more important later. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about this one comic section where it's Minnie, um, her friend Kimmy, and Monroe on the beach. And oh, yeah. something so, that works so well about the, seeing the landscape of the beach and them running around and drinking these beers and this sort of, um, just the feel of, and the way that looks visually that I think to me, felt like yes, this this needs to be expressed as a comic. This, you know, rather than um, the diary entries, I think that that felt right to me. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, you're not thinking that yeah. when you're doing it. You're just thinking, I'm gonna draw this, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, cool. So, this book was made into a movie recently, and, um, uh, yeah, I'm just a little bit curious what your experience, what your experience in that was. It was adapted, so it was written and directed by Marielle Heller, who did a stage play first. And um, so I guess you didn't have that much involvement in the creation of the movie, or did you? Were you involved to any degree well, creatively, or what was your role? I think I was this kind of looming, <laughs> threatening. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Judgment. <laughs> no, uh, the director was very young yeah. and had never done a film before. And she was... She loved the book, and she was obsessed with it. Her sister had given it to her for Christmas, and she just, you know, at first, you know, I asked, she asked me, could she do this, could she do that? And I said, well, maybe I'll think about it. But, I mean, she wanted to do this play, and there were other directors who wanted to direct it as a movie. Um, I didn't like their ideas, and so... What were some other directors' ideas? Like, how, what were their visions for it? Well, one guy who I spoke with, I met with him, like, four times... And he had done other films that I kind of liked, and I was really considering it. Um, but I, I said, I said, okay, if you make this film, my daughters have to be in it. And he said, no. Okay, so that I was like, fuck you then, yeah. right? But um, and then, then he was trying to convince me, and he told me how great it was going to be. And he said, and I have a different ending for the book. And I said, well, what's it going to be? And she, Minnie marries Monroe. <laughs> so, oh my God, <laughs> that's horrifying. I know. That's really traumatic. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't. I mean, what do you even say to a person in that moment? Like, how do you respond to such a dis? I just said, I don't think you really yeah. understand the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he didn't do it. Um, and when Marielle came and said she wanted to do a play, I was, like, so shocked. Like, a play? This is not going to make a... What? Play? I don't even look at plays, you know. Um, and I said, well, knock yourself out. Go ahead and try. And there's also a lot less risk in a play because a movie sticks around forever, and if you don't like it, it's just going to make you feel bad forever and ever and ever. But a play is just, you know, it'll have a run if it's lucky, and it'll be a month or whatever. Um, but it was pretty good, and... She wanted to do the movie, so I said, okay. I mean, I, I couldn't really say no, because by that time, she was my friend. I mean, she had come to my house in Michigan, like, a bunch of times. Yeah. And and was it always, like, she was always, <laughs> I'm going to, I guess she had written and directed the play, so she was like, no, I'm going to write and direct this movie. So it wasn't like, do you want to collaborate? Well, it, there, w or? there was that opening for oh, it. There was, okay. And um, I had... You know, after the guy said she, he wanted Minnie to marry Monroe, mm -hmm. I had actually started writing a screenplay myself because it was kind of angry. Like, yeah. but, but um, I didn't want to live with that story anymore. Yeah. I mean, it was based on my life, and it took me a long time to make. And all anyone ever asked me about it was, "Is this your real life? Did you really have these experiences?" And so, I to to continue that with you know me writing the film and everything. I just couldn't do it. I had no interest in that anymore. Yeah. But um, nevertheless, she showed me every iteration, millions of iterations of the screenplay. I could have you know, contributed. I could have done the animation. Mm -hmm. But again, I, you know, what was the point to me creatively, really? Yeah. There's yeah. no point anymore because, and I was already working on something else. Yeah. So um, then I was on the set much of the time when it was being shot. So I was always present. It was very important to me to be a part of it, if not directly. I wanted to be a part of it because that is part of me. So, yeah. And how did you feel when you first saw it? Um, when I first saw the play, I was holding back tears. I was, you know, it was like watching ghosts of my past which I had also filtered as characters, it was very strange, you know, walking around. I felt like I should be able to talk to them, and they'll just yeah. respond in character. Um, and then by the time the movie came around, I didn't have that same overwhelming emotion 
the first time I saw it. Um, but of course I knew about it having seen it been filmed, right? Um, but, you know, at that time, I mean, it's even stupid to ask me about it because as the author, you're comparing it to what you did and what was made from that, right? So It's hard to be objective. Right. And I, I guess, you know, in fact, I love the film. Um, the, there were a few scenes that made me nervous and I thought would be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. And um, Can you tell us which? Sure. And I've talked about that before. I don't think the makers of the film appreciate that I talk about that, which is, I mean, but it's not a criticism, it's an observation. Yeah. Um, there's a scene in the beginning before Minnie, the teenage girl, um, gets involved with her mother's boyfriend, um, and they're in a bar, and they're just playing around, and she sucks his finger um, in a very sexual way, and that didn't happen in the book or otherwise. It, it was, it made, it gave her, as many people noted, in a positive way. It said it, it seemed to give her agency. She owned her sexuality. She had the power. Um, but th that wasn't there. She was naive. I mean, she didn't, had never kissed a boy. She had, she did not, she wasn't a girl who would have done that. Yeah. Um, and that really bothered me because it seemed to change the meaning of the whole story. And in D and there's another line at the end, which I didn't write in the book. It, um, Minnie's mother says to her, you have a kind of power. You have a kind of power. You don't know it. You know, the way you look and as a woman, you know, this is a power you have. And I thought to myself, you know, how many boys are told by their fathers you know, you're a good-looking boy. You have a kind of power. <laughs> I mean, wow. fuck that shit. It is, the, it is the most unempowering yeah. statement to make. And I think you hear it all the time. You know, women don't realize how powerful they are. You know, they have this... It uh, becomes this external thing. It's an them. external yeah. thing. It has all to do with another's gaze. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you inside. Mm -hmm. And if you recognize that as power and you use it, it's like, it's like a person who has a hundred bucks in the world and they decided to go spell it, spend it on je jelly beans. Yeah. It's not going to bring back anything to you if you use sexuality in that way to feel good about yourself. That's not love. You know, it's, it, it's really nothing. Yeah. Um, and I think I hear that so often about the power of you know, sexually attractive people or, or young people or whatever. It, it, I'm surprised that there's not more commentary about that because it, it's, it seems like a, an almost a, a crime. It's like calling someone a racial epithet. I mean, it's, yeah, not, it's yeah. so hurtful because people believe this somehow. And I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this makes me really curious about the project that you're working on now and sort of um, which feels, which is not, autobiographical, I don't think you figure into it, or maybe partially, but it's it's mainly um, the series that you're doing based on families living in Juarez, Mexico. And yeah. Uh, I'll just talk a little about that. This, yeah, this I, would, is I would love to hear about it and sort of what um, it was like to move from, not autobio, but things based on your experiences into writing more about other people. Well, um, but of course, I did write about other people. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, that aspect of it is not different. That's true. Um, but it's a very good question, and I didn't know how that was going to go in the beginning. I was asked to go to to Juarez, Mexico, kind of out of the. Warner, is that you? Yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> a former student, Warner King Washington the Third. Hi, Warner. It's good to see you. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> so, um, sorry, I just, I, I have all these questions for him, <laughs> but I just, like, <laughs> um, okay, so I'm down in Mexico, someone asked me to go there, I didn't want to go there, it was this actress, 
<laughs> we both know Mia Kirshner was doing this project, I Live Here, and, and she was asking right. like four different artists or something to... To, to, do, to go down to different parts of the world and report on bad things happening to children and women. And um, I didn't want to do it. I said no three times. And she kept coming back. You're the only one who could do this. You're the only one. This is for the people. This is for, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. It's going to save the world. And um, later on, of course, I found out that she'd asked Jessica Abel to do it. And Jessica said no. So uh, <laughs> did, if I smoke this, this is, not, this is va water vapor. So just, like, don't, like, worry. No case. <laughs> We're all on board with it. <laughs> but maybe not. I don't know. Okay. So anyway, um, anyway, out of guilt and not wanting, I had just finished Diary of a Teenage Girl. I had sent it to the press myself. I couldn't work with the designer at my publisher because I kept changing things around. And she says, if you change anything out around anymore, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to charge so much money. You can't do this. But of course I had to. So anyway, so I ended up designing it myself, sending it to the printer. And I had that book in my hand a month after I published, after I finished it, which is unusual. You usually have like, wait a year or something, you know? So anyway, I, it, it was emotionally shocking for me, and I felt, you know, if you finish something that you've been working on for a long time, after you finish it, you feel like you might as well be dead. I mean, you, you do have nothing to live for. It, it's very hard to, to, to get back and even realize what your own life is. So I was kind of depressed and in this, like, shell shock state, and she calls me up, and I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go. I actually had two other books that I was planning. But anyway... She guilted me into it, and, and I'm a weak person, and I accepted. <laughs> and um, I went to Mexico, and I had only been to Mexico one time, and that was with Tom Tomorrow, Karen Leshin, and Paul Mavides, all of whom are cartoonists. We went to Tijuana for half an hour while we were at the San Diego Comic-Con. Um, so that was my only time, and I speak Czech, and I speak French, but I don't speak Spanish or I spoke none at that time. And I went down to Mexico, and for two weeks, we were taken from place to place to meet the parents of, of young girls, children and teenagers who had been brutally murdered. And we would go be invited into their homes and hear their stories. And it, it was, I had two little girls myself, and I was, it was so, it affected me so profoundly. Because you're looking at all the fears you've ever had. and you're seeing them reflected in someone's face and they're real. And the other aspect of that, which was foreign to me, was the poverty, the nature of which I've never seen in the United States. I mean, maybe one person or one pocket, you know, there aren't just like, but in this part of Mexico, there was just like miles of neighborhoods of like basically shanty towns, squatters, you know, people, everything made of, um, you know, building pallets and tires and cardboard um, with no infrastructure that had caught up to the area by that time. So people, you know, there was no garbage removal, there, were no, there was no electricity, no water. Um, anyway, so I had never seen these things before. And I eventually did this story for, for Mia Kirshner. And it wasn't a story. I said, I, I can't do a story about any one person because I, I don't know this enough. I don't, this is not normalized for me. I can't put this in any context. So I can't tell their story. I, it just feels disingenuous and I'm not a reporter and I'm not just gonna sit there and illustrate facts. So I, I did like vignettes, maybe they're here, like pages, uh, yeah, yeah, like that's from it. I just did big pictures that were, you know, with lines from Walt Whitman. And it's like, but by that time, I'd already started to try to learn Spanish, and I was using Google Translation a lot. So everything I wrote, the way I learned Spanish, I, all of the, the patterns I learned were from the translator, because I wasn't speaking to anyone. And so I, I was writing in this way that sounded very much like the language of the Google Translator in 2008 or whatever it was. And, um, but it, it was beautiful to me. And it, it, 
it's how I felt when I was at, at the border. But anyway, so these are from the piece for Mia Kirshner. And they're, you know, reenactments of murders that were in the news. Um, and, oh, you can't see it. See, there's a sentence up there by the blackboard thing. And you know how sometimes you get spam and it just says, like, nonsense or something? Anyway, I got this big page of spam and I was reading it because I was thinking, why, what is, is this about a product? Or I couldn't understand. And one of the lines was, your blood has gotten even thicker, so your wounds bleed less. And I don't know, it seemed to illustrate the situation. Um, oh, that's not, okay, this is. Can you tell us how you're making these dolls? Because it looks like they're. Yeah, well, you would see 3D it. objects, but then you've. Um, put a face on them. Can you tell us a little bit about Yeah. That? This is a little bit misleading because right now they don't all have faces mm -hmm. in real life as I'm working on them. Um, these were like, you know, morphed faces that I was like, I was taking pictures of my students. I think I have pictures of Warner. Um, and using their faces or combining features to, to give the dolls life. And... Um, then, th you don't even have to listen to this, but wait, mm -hmm. this is just a very wow. simple animation, which it's nothing but th that's my face. But uh, so how do you, tech, can you tell us technically what you're doing in, like in Photoshop, are you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little more of a pain in the ass than it appears to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the dolls are all felted dolls. I mean, it took, I've got like 50 doll characters, but it's, took me a long time to make them and each one of them is different inside size because inside because I was learning how to make the armatures as I went along so if I had started from scratch thinking that I would animate things or I would have made it all smaller and done something different but anyway I'm, I'm working with what I have and it's working um but the faces you're interested technically how that's done yeah well I take a bunch of pictures of you doing all sorts of expressions and turning around. <laughs> but you don't really look, you don't really look too Mexican and your proportions are not doll-like. Well, well, they could be, yeah. but they're not exactly yeah. what I was looking for. So, um, you know, maybe, uh, so then I, 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 but I think you're gonna be a good so-and-so. Yeah. Right, okay. You can be Modesta. Okay. okay? So. I'll take these off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but, okay, so I'm in Detroit, I'm near Detroit, yeah. and there aren't many Hispanic people, so yeah. your skin is too pale, too. Yeah. But, so, but the dolls are Mexican, so, you know, the, very simply, I would have to start adjusting yeah. the hue and saturation for your skin tone, and that's not, doesn't always work either. And then maybe your nose does not look like a typical mestizo nose, yeah. right? So I'm going to have to, like alter that to to be wider or, yeah. or or shorter or something and i mean it, it's everything you think i'm i'm, I'm well, just so like you're actually like in photoshop manipulating the faces to turn into what looks closer to what looks right, looks right. Yeah. and sometimes i use somebody else's eyes yeah. and um so it's it's kind of like this lame hodgepodge but i do it until it looks like who i think it is mm -hmm. and i have this thing always you know, how many of you are actually comics artists? Okay. Okay, so I, people kind of half-heartedly raised their own. Stand proud. Okay. But do you know, I'm sure you've experienced that. When you're drawing something, it's almost like creating a fetish. It's like, you know, the more you care about the drawing and who you're drawing, the more it comes to life, life in your own Head. You have this relationship with that thing. And it, then you're more interested in their story, and you can also just do a better story. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so um, anyway, so I would, would really painstakingly try to get the right face so I could feel like I love that little creature, whether he's a killer or a dead girl or what. You, know, I, you have to love something in all the characters, unfortunately. But... Um, so yeah, but the complication with anima animating that kind of thing, mm -hmm. if, if I want to keep these faces that way, is that each face is, so, is constructed not of one face. So yeah. 
and it, it's distorted in many different ways. So the animation is very painstaking. I mean, that one with the face there, it, it just, um, it was easy because it, I just distorted it. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So you take a photo um, of the dolls, and then you yeah. put that photo in Photoshop, and then you put the face that you've created also in Photoshop onto the dolls, and right. then you animate. Right, but it's not all animated. And yeah. that that's an example just of a test, because nothing else is moving there. Yeah. So that actually gives it a kind of a weird feeling, like that, you know, you see it all the time, the things on your iPhone, where you go, you know. <laughs> but... But it doesn't bother me. I don't know. Um, but I have a lot more com complex animations that I've been working on, but uh, they're not here because this is an old slideshow. Um, anyway, that... Uh, uh, and then talking about like feeling close to your subjects, because I don't live in Mexico, my whole studio is covered with sand. It's in the attic, so the floor is sand. It used to be loose sand, but then the cats would come up and shit in it. So, <laughs> um, so then I started mixing it with a giant litter box. Yeah, Thank you. That lasted like one day. I saw that and I'm like, uh-uh. Uh, so, so I think even here I started mixing the mixing the um, sand with like a vinyl library glue and adhering it to canvas and then just having like minimal loose sand when I needed it. But anyway, that it's not so interesting, but my whole studio and my garage it, are scenes from the desert, from this place. And when I'm in, when I go into my studio, I feel like, ah, okay, I'm back. I mean, I feel like I'm there. I mean, I think that's what I've created for myself is a way. Yes, I'm writing about other people, but I'm very much there. Yeah. And, um, is it more, is, anyway, this, I don't know what these pictures are, so I'm just, that guy, that's a graduate student of mine. <laughs> um, uh, cool, we yeah. just have about five, ten minutes left, so I'd love to open it up to you guys. Do you have any questions for Phoebe about anything that we've talked about or her career? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm kind of been working that out all along. I mean, very early on, I thought, okay, it's great I have these dolls, maybe I can animate them later. Because I was thinking I could expand my idea of making a book, a printed book. It'll be a long book, the printed version, like three or 400 pages, write a novel, and um, with pictures, with text. Um, but I wanted, I want to do, and have been creating work for, intended for, an interactive book where things do move. I haven't quite seen anything like it, so I can't say, oh, it's like that or that. Um, but there's a lot of problems with that. Um, Adobe has kind of like shut the door on people who are trying to make... Uh, like little apps that they can test on their phones, and they used to have this plugin for in, for InDesign. Then you can do that up till February twenty second. Now, if you want to do that and really like, you know, you have to buy into their marketing enterprise system, which is intended for large publishers. It's it, it's thousands and thousands of dollars per month, and this is just not even to sell stuff. It's to like use this technology. So then I looked at lots of other different little companies. It's incredibly frustrating, but. The other thing, distribution is difficult because if you have a book that's over 200 megabytes, which this will be, even if it's divided into pieces, it would still be too large. Um, the, you know, the distribution sites like iTunes or iBooks and Google Books and all that stuff, and even Amazon particularly, um, they don't accept books in that format. And they have some exempt, sec, exceptions, which would be some textbooks they will accept as larger or children's book apps. So it's, it's like there's not even the way to, to, to do that right now. And I mean, you're nodding your head, so you must know about Adobe and all that crap. It's so frustrating. Um, but nevertheless, I'm continuing as if it, at some future point, this will be exactly what I want it to be, and you will be able to see it. Um, but right now, 
there's lots of things in my way, and I'm not a programmer. And yes, I could learn, and I've learned to do many things, but the more you realize, even if you're a person who likes to do things and learn new things and do them by themselves and have control of it, you, you can only do, do so much yourself without, without like, sacrificing your creative work because you just... So I have faith that somehow, some way, I will find someone or some company or something that will be able to help me, you know, bring my vision public. But it, it, so I'm trying not to think about it and just kind of have hope. <laughs> but because I've looked for sure. But anyway, these are real people that I know, and in Mexico, and I don't know. Oh, that's seasons in the time. Are there other questions? <laughs> Well, I'm a full-time professor at the University of Michigan, so that's kind of, but it's so rewarding seeing students like Warner, <laughs> um, and, and I also have children, um, but yes, I've worked on, on projects other than this all along, just little things stories, pieces for other publications. Yeah. You, just ask me a question, please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you tell me why you didn't like it? I felt like he was happy. Did you hear her question, everybody? She said she's talking about the film adaptation, and she mentioned that some of the casting she holds in question. She said she didn't, didn't like Alexander Skarsgård being cast as the male lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think he gives casting a very, very handsome, attractive man. Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess it is um, more acceptable because he is attractive. But honestly, you know, whether you found my drawings of him attractive or not, I think that Minnie thought he was beautiful. So, you know, and that's in the eye of the beholder. So, the same, you know, attraction was going on there, but I guess in order to make it comprehensible to people who might not appreciate a certain look, they get someone who will appeal to everyone. And yeah, you're right, that's always done in movies. Yeah. Right, because it appealed to them sexually. It's like, it, it, yeah, wow, you know, yeah. 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 No, no, I think you're absolutely right. But I, yeah, and the, the reason for it is that it's a film, and in order to get it made and distributed, you need a name and it's to your advantage is that people are attractive. So, glamorizing abuse, yeah. But you know, any story, even if it's a biopic about you know Bill Gates, you know him. He and his wife are going to 
look pretty good. I mean, <laughs> it's it's rare that they would use someone who just looks like you know any of us. Or you guys are gorgeous, but you know I, I don't know. You know what I'm saying, right? So yeah, yeah. tries to get into the 15 year old girl's sense of her own. This is what something, this is what she wants. And I, I guess I found that refreshing on some level, like it wasn't a total victim story, but then you're also saying maybe it did that too much or you don't like that at all. No, no. What I think it was good at is the fact that in so many films, girls don't have sexuality. They can be sexy, and they can elicit a response, but they don't, their sexuality is seen as something that's emanating from them rather than something that is through and through and is like all of us, we're sexual, right? So uh, the fact that, and it makes people queasy, I imagine, from what I was reading, to, to think of a girl like that having sexual feelings. It, it's hard to objectify someone who has their own I don't know if you'd call it agency, but to acknowledge that those feelings are inside of her and not just in your head and your oh, oh, right. Um, so, you, so I guess I, my question was that I felt like earlier you were saying certain parts of the book, like the sucking on the finger or the um, you need to know about your power, maybe gave her. Well, the fact is, she was a girl who was, yeah. at that very moment, the, the first moment there was any kind of sexual act, that girl, the moment before, never believed it was really going to happen. Mm -hmm. And always had the feeling, knew what the order of relationship, that's her mother's boyfriend. You know, so even if he was like taking her to a bar or whatever, it wasn't going to happen. Like the but then it did. Broken, and in the movie, she breaks the boundary. Exactly. So it was more like you, you don't disagree with sort of them showing so much of her own impetus for this relationship. No. Just the, that particular way in which it started and stuff like that. Exactly, because she, w she never would have started. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, it so felt like she. Sexual feelings weren't there. It was that. It was this idea that she stuck to the finger before to just do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. That she would think to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't really understand anything about sexuality. So the question is maybe about something else. Yeah. Two is okay. Do you frequently return to Mexico? Yes. You do. Uh huh. How for the last 10 years, I've been going, on average, three or four times a year. The same place. The same place to, to Suida Juarez. And, um, yeah, it, you know, it's been, I mean, and if you know the place, it's like, you know, in 2010, nearly 4,000 people were murdered in a town the size of Detroit, where 400 people were murdered. So it's just a, a it's, it was you know, the most dangerous or the, the place most likely for you to be murdered. Um, well, I'm able to think to myself, I'm invisible. But I'm not, because I look different. But, you know, you just, you, you, you kind of walk through a cloud like in fantasy. You're an observer, and you just hope no one's going to notice. So I think, I know there's danger, and I know, well, especially in the past, because the violence really has begun to subside and has reached nearly the level it was in 2003. So, um, but I saw a lot of violence. I um, lived through the repercussions of violence. I know people who have been murdered. I had two people from the same family who were activists. They lived with me for nine months at my house in, in Detroit because, or in Michigan because um, 
they had gotten a death threat. Two other members of their family were murdered, assassinated, and it was very hard to get political asylum, especially at the border, especially if you're Mexican. So I got a hold of someone in the law department at my university, and he offered to take their case pro bono, and it takes a long time. They lived with me for nine months. And my friend, Raoui, he slept under the bed all the time. He had post-traumatic shock. I mean, it was a crazy time. I mean, it was not a comfortable time. I mean, it's not as violent now, but things certainly do still happen, and there's still horrible poverty and inequity, and it's it's hard for poor kids to go to school beyond sixth grade. It's It's not expected you know so people don't anyway it's you know but i love mexico yeah, the other question was um, has to do more with process i guess yeah so i'm not i haven't seen like a lot of your drawings past the, the diary the teenage girl uh, i haven't seen many drawings recently it's mostly the um, the dolls the right online. do you have you found that working uh, with that kind of stuff Building these dolls and like construct like constructing these elaborate you know sets mm -hmm. is it um, how is that is it or how is it maybe uh, sort of affecting your creative process in your drawings? I mean, does it is it actually like affecting the way you work in the drawings at all, or vice versa? I mean, obviously there's some uh, you know compositional I guess elements that are similar. But right, it's similar. I mean, you know, when I'm doing it, I feel like it feels like the same activity. I mean, it doesn't look like it, but in my head, it's like making a drawing. Um, but I'm just doing it with other things. Yeah, I'm creating an environment. So for me, it's like I'm using the same parts of my brain. Um, and drawing, all of these activities are pleasurable to me, drawing or making things. And um, some people have come to me rather mournfully, like, when are you going to draw again? But, you know, I don't, I don't hold that particular activity as being more precious or important to me than the other ones. It's like my end is not any particular drawing. It is what it means. Or it's the story. And all these things function together to, it's, you know, I don't know. Did I answer it? Sure. Okay. Okay, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, this is shifting gears a little bit, but I was just wondering, like, early on, was there, how did you sort of, did you ever, like, decide or have fear about representing, like, sexual or explicit material? Like, did you have any point where you were like, okay, this is, like, the story that I need to tell, so I'm going to do it? Or, like, was there any fear involved for you, or have you always sort of, been able to freely express those things? Um, I've always been able to freely express those things, even when I was a kid. And maybe <laughs> I would draw penises. I didn't know what they looked like, but I would draw them uh, to show my friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I don't know if that was some perversion inside of me or if it was the influence of my family. You know, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't mean anything good, but at any rate, I, I always felt like if I was drawing something where sex was even implied, if I, why shouldn't I draw it? And if I didn't, that's kind of dishonest. Um, and people have, you know, criticized me, my work as being, someone called it, some guy was running for office in California, a librarian complained about my book, and they, and he held it up during one of his speeches and said it was a a handbook for pedophiles. And the thing is, I mean, but in my mind, it's like, I'm not a child pornographer. You know, if, if, if you see these things as sexy, that's in your head, really. I'm telling this story. This is what this child saw. Why shouldn't I be able to be, to, to report honestly what this child saw? I'm not protecting anyone by doing, by not doing that. So... But also, sex was interesting to me because it's so bizarre. I mean, you know, 
it really is weird. I mean, in our normal lives, if we're, we're fully clothed and walk around, but just the act of sex is so strange. I mean, when I first heard about it, I couldn't believe that really happened. <laughs> like, do you really, you, you see a boy naked? You know, like, I mean, I don't know, maybe you guys accept it more easily, but I mean, part of this, like, I was confounded by it, so I was fascinated by it. And the medical illustration is like, I always wanted to know what happened inside my body as well as inside my head. I mean, where I, my work usually is. So knowing the inside of the body in different ways, there's nothing wrong with it. So why shouldn't I draw whatever? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all for coming out. And Phoebe and I will both be down at the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund table signing for the next couple hours. So enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.